All right. Hi, guys. Most of you know me because I'm your club's outreach coordinator. But in case you don't know me, I'm Ben. I'm the outreach coordinator for the Cornell Astronomical Society. Um, hi. Um, tonight's lecture is going to be uh, hosted by Maura. Uh, she's a third year uh, graduate student in Cornell's very own uh, Department of Astronomy. And she's also part of the Carl Sagan Institute. And she does research on exoplanet atmospheres. So uh, without further ado, I'll pass it to Maura. And uh, please enjoy. And thank you for being here. Hello, everybody. Uh, I hope everyone in the room and on Zoom can hear me, because uh, this is about as good as it gets. <laughs> uh, all right. So yeah, uh, as introduced today, I'm going to be talking about exoplanets in general. I'll talk a little bit about how we detect them, and then I'll go into my favorite kind, which are transiting exoplanets. So in we go. Uh, these are the main questions that I'm going to try to answer today during this talk. Uh, first of all, what's an exoplanet? How do we see them? And how can we study their atmospheres? Which is what I try to do. So starting with the most basic, what is an exoplanet? So in here, I've put a few different types of systems that we might see when we're looking for exoplanets. At the top here for comparison purposes is our lovely solar system. Uh, you may recognize our little hometown up there. Um, and you might notice, just from glancing at these, that it looks significantly different from these other examples of exoplanet systems that I've shown here. Uh, the second example that I've given is the LTT-1445 system. This is a pretty unusual one. Uh, it is the closest M-dwarf exoplanet to us. Um, but you can see there that the planet is at the bottom. And those two other bright dots there are two other stars. So the LTT-1445 system is a triple star system. Uh, and there are, I think, at least two exoplanets that orbit one of those three stars. So it's got a lot of complicated dynamics going on, very foreign from our own solar system. Uh, right below that is the TRAPPIST-1 system, which uh, some of you might have heard a bit about. There's a lot of hype about this one because um, it seems to be maybe the closest thing that we found to Earth-like exoplanets. Uh, and we, we think that some of these, maybe two or three of these planets, might be uh, in the habitable zone of their star. But even so, even though it's the only kind of Earth-like, viable Earth-like system that we have, uh, you can tell already that it, it still looks very different from our own solar system. At the bottom here, this is a system that doesn't really have a name because I just kind of grabbed a image of a hot Jupiter from Google Images. But this is the other kind of system that we've seen a lot of, which is just a star in a really big, really close planet orbiting it. All right, onward. Uh, we've touched on some of these, but what are some of the kinds of most popular exoplanets out there that we can see? First of all, my one true love, hot Jupiters. Um, but we also see some kind of planets called super-Earths or sub-Neptunes. This is kind of the thing that we find in the TRAPPIST-1 system. Uh, they're Earths, but bigger. Uh, and the ones that we have been looking the most for, or at least the ones that we tell our funders that we're looking the most for, Earth-like planets in their habitable zones. Uh, so on to the next question. If this is the kind of thing that we're seeing and the kind of thing that we're looking for, uh, how actually do we observe them? So I'm going to start with the most obvious method of detection, which is direct detection, direct imaging. Uh, and this is something that um, is a pretty recent development in the field of exoplanet science. Uh, and this is a nice GIF of a set of, observa of observations of a directly imaged exoplanet system. Uh, you can see the star in the middle is kind of blacked out, and you can see a series of objects very, very slowly orbiting around the star in the middle there. Uh, in the bottom left is the kind of progression of dates of these observations. Um, so if you, if you look at that, you can tell that um, it took about eight years of continuous observation to get this data. Uh, and uh, we don't see the full orbit of any of these planets that are in this GIF, 
uh, even though we have observed about eight Earth years. So that tells us something about these, and that's that they are orbiting pretty far away from their stars. Um, it's kind of a debate when the first exoplanet was directly imaged. Um, it's a little controversial, but several exoplanets, I would say, were directly imaged in the early 2000s, but either they didn't have the mass data to confirm that the star's pair was a planet, or else they thought it was a planet, but it turned out to be a brown dwarf or a, another star of some kind. So the data set here is a, is a really clean, a really clear one. Um, and you can see that the, the end of this is about 2016, so pretty recent. Uh, in general, this method is best suited to um, showing very bright planets because they, um, they have to show up, obviously, in this kind of observation but they also are typically in very long orbits. They have to be pretty far away from their stars so that they aren't kind of drowned out by the, the stellar light, the host star's light. So often these planets are very large and very young. Uh, sometimes they're even about 100 AU away from their star. And for reference, one AU is the distance from Earth to our sun. So these, you're not really gonna be finding quote unquote, Earth-like habitable planets with this method. Uh, we also can't really find much constraining information about the planets just from direct imaging. Uh, as is true in most exoplanet observations, the more we know about the star, the more we can find out about the planet by comparison. Um, and we can pretty much from these only find weak constraints on the mass of the exoplanet. So. On to the next, uh, a very reliable early method was radial velocity. And you can kind of see in this GIF here uh, what's going on here. So the, the thing on top shows the system. As the planet orbit or orbits around the star, it's, it's really not orbiting the star, it's orbiting a common center of mass. So the star, uh, is kind of wiggling left and right and forward and back uh, as the planet orbits it. And as it moves uh, closer to us and further away from us as a result of the planet's orbit, uh, its light is kind of subject to a Doppler effect. So in the same way that an ambulance whizzing past us on the road sounds you know, high-pitched and then low-pitched, a star that's being orbited by an exoplanet will appear redder as it's moving away and the planet's moving towards us, and then bluer as the planet is moving away and pushing the star towards us. It can be a little complicated, but um, I hope the GIF helps. Uh, and then I have some more details here. So um, this was a very prolific early way of detecting exoplanets. And when I say early, that pretty much just means kind of late 90s, early 2000s, because um, some context, the first exoplanet was only observed in the early 90s. So this entire field is of observational exoplanet studies is, is pretty new. Uh, in this method, the radial velocity method is best suited to finding pretty large exoplanets orbiting around low mass stars, because the larger the planet is and the closer the orbit is to the star, and the smaller the star is, uh, the more the star will be influenced by the planet's gravitational pull, and the more it'll do this kind of wiggling motion towards us and away from us as the exoplanet orbits. Uh, so the amplitude, this, this curve on the right kind of shows the data that we are receiving from the star. Uh, as the spectrum of the star kind of wiggles back and forth, we can get a sense of how, how fast it's moving towards us and away from us. So um, the amplitude of that curve on the right provides a good constraint on the mass of the exoplanet. This is the best way that we have of empirically determining the mass of an exoplanet. Again, assuming, assuming that we know a thing or two about the mass of the star. All right, onward to the most, the currently the most prolific method of detecting exoplanets, which are transits. And that's very straightforward, very simple. We watch a star and we see a planet move in front of the star and block a little bit of the light. So, all right, shown here on the right of this slide is a full orbit of data. Uh, and this is otherwise known as a phase curve. 
Uh, that's often what it will be called. And uh, this tra the transit method is the method that's responsible for most of our currently discovered exoplanets. We have found somewhere above 5,000 at this point. Um, and you can see that, uh, so the line across the bottom that kind of looks like, you know, hook em horns, like whatever, <laughs> long horns logo is the light curve. So as the planet is behind the star, there's a little bit of a dip. And then as the planet circles around, there's a component of reflected light of the star's light reflected off the planet that has a certain shape to it. And then the transit is when the planet passes in front of the star from the observer's standpoint and the light curve dips significantly as the planet blocks out a section of the star's light uh, and then it happens again on the other side and that's one orbit one full phase curve so um these uh, a lot of planets that have this kind of orbital geometry where it, it's kind of an edge on orbit from us and we can see the planet passing in front of the star a lot of these were discovered by the Kepler spacecraft, uh, which was explicitly tasked with making these kinds of observations and would kind of stare at the same section of the sky for about four years of time. Uh, and this method is best at finding very large exoplanets, which will block a lot of the star's light as it passes in front. Uh, and it also you'd want those planets to be very in very close orbits, because again, the closer they are, the, the more of the star's light they are blocking. And this kind of observation can give us a very good radius constraint on the planet. If you look at the depth of that transit of the light curve, that will tell you how big the planet is compared to the star. So again, a good radius constraint on the planet, assuming that we know something about the radius of the star. OK, so this is a plot showing kind of the relative popularity of these different detection methods. Uh, it only goes up to 2020, so I assure you there've been like, I don't know, about 1,500 more exoplanets detected since then. Uh, and you can see how kind of in the early days, radial velocity was kind of the goat here. But as soon as Kepler launched, which I think was in 2009, uh, transits really started to take over as the quickest way to find these exoplanets. Uh, and you can imagine that I'm not going to talk about this much more in the rest of the presentation, but it's useful to kind of think about the kind of observational biases that this introduces into the kinds of exoplanet systems that we can see. So a lot of these methods are only really good at finding very bright exoplanets. Um, both radial velocity and transit method favors planets that are very big compared to their star and in very close orbits. So that's part of the explanation of why we have so many observed hot Jupiter exoplanets. Um, hot Jupiters are kind of like if Jupiter was in like a very close orbit around its host star, some hot Jupiters orbit like one Earth day is like a year for a hot Jupiter. So um, that's, that's part of the explanation for why we have observed so many of that type of planet and not so many Earth type planets, um, which are a little further away and a lot smaller. So uh, there's also some other detection methods up here that I'm not going to touch on, including uh, micro lensing, timing variations, uh, astrometry, yada, yada. Part of this is because they are a very small component of the exoplanets that we've discovered so far. And also for some of these methods, um, for example, microlensing, it really only allows for one observation of the exoplanet. So it's it's tough to locate that planet and try to do follow-up observations, which are a huge part of how we can do atmospheric studies. So on to the next section of the talk. Uh, how can we study exoplanet atmospheres? Uh, and this is most of what I do. So the the kind of most straightforward way to do this, the easiest to explain, is transmission spectroscopy. Uh, and this figure above here shows uh, a little hint of how that's done. So in the orbit of one planet, during the transit, during the part where the planet is going in front of the star, uh, there's some 
stellar light, some of the star's radiation that's transmitted through the planet's atmosphere. The, the bulk of the planet, if there is a, you know, a ground, if there is a, a solid of the planet, will block all of the star's light. But then there will be a certain extent of atmosphere where certain wavelengths of the star's light will be filtered through and make it to us, the observer. Um, all right, so let's go into some more detail on how exactly transmission spectroscopy works. Uh, this is just a, a little GIF showing of exactly, exactly what I've explained, where as the planet passes in front of the star, blocks the star's light, you see a dip. Uh, that's the transit there. And the depth of that transit will tell you something about the radius of the planet. Now, if you look in a single wavelength, um, this is all you're going to find out. You're going to say, OK, whatever the depth of that is, that's the radius of the planet, moving on. If you look in multiple wavelengths uh, of light, different, different colors, as it were, visible or infrared, et cetera, you might find that the depth of that transit is different across those different wavelengths. So now you have a problem because you're saying, OK, well, we have a, a lot of different results here across different wavelengths. Which one of these is the real radius of the planet? Uh, and one reason that this might happen is if there is an atmosphere and it's transmitting different amounts of the host star's light at different wavelengths. So uh, you can kind of make up, this is obviously a sketch and not real data, <laughs> but from these kinds of observations at a number of different wavelengths, uh, you can make a little plot, something like this, where the y-axis would be the planet radius, what the radius appears to be, uh, and the x-axis would be the wavelength. Uh, and the shape of this uh, spectrum would tell you a lot of information about the exoplanet's atmosphere. So uh, we're going to jump into a little bit of an explanation about how we do this for super-Earths. Uh, and a super-Earth is just an exoplanet in the mass range of about 2 to 10 Earth masses. So it's sitting in that range where it's a little bit bigger than Earth. Uh, but a bit smaller than the solar system ice giants like Uranus or Neptune. Um, but there's a question of what makes super-Earths different than ice or gas giants. Uh, and for those larger and higher mass planets, their uh, expected mass radius relationship will tell you something about the bulk composition of the planet. Uh, and for those bigger planets, that's, that's kind of all the information you need. However, uh, for smaller planets, let's see where I'm at here in this presentation. Uh, for smaller planets, it becomes more of a question. Uh, if a smaller planet especially has a significant, significant atmospheric component, there are a number of different bulk compositions that could work for any given radius and mass, and you'll need more information to break those degeneracies. Uh, and with one wavelength, there's kind of no way to tell between a water world, a rocky planet with a hydrogen atmosphere, or countless other options that are vastly different from one another. So as an example, we are going to kind of run through exactly how do scientists do this uh, through a ground-based transmission spectrum of the super-Earth GJ1214b. All exoplanets have these kind of very unfortunate and boring names. Uh, <laughs> so let's get into the into the nitty gritty here. Uh, this is a plot from a Charbonneau et al. 2009 paper, which was the paper that reported the discovery of our friend GJ1214b. Uh, and it was initially reported to have a mass of six and a half Earth masses and a radius of about two and a half Earth radii which puts it um, on this mass radius plot here. Uh, you can see where it is that dark red filled in point. Um, and this plot situates it against other observed transiting exoplanets, which are shown in red. Most of them are cut off at the top because they're uh, very high radius. But um, let's see. 
it, it also shows some of the solar system planets. And it also has these curved lines on it, which show basically where we would expect planets with different compositions to fall on this mass radius plot. Uh, and the solid line is a hydrogen helium rich planet. Uh, and the dashed line shows a pure water planet. And the dotted one is a water dominated planet which I think in this case is about a 75% water with a silicon and iron core. Um, and the dash dot line is an Earth-like planet, which has the whatever assumed composition, um, whatever we got going on on Earth, silicon and iron, et cetera. Uh, so we can see that our super Earth GJ1214b is kind of hanging out right around the water dominated line. Uh, but the low density of the planet does suggest that it has a major gas component. So we don't really know what effect a significant atmosphere would have on these predictions, if it would kind of move it around this plot, if we assumed that it had a, a large atmosphere. So uh, you, can, you can see here the significance of this analysis, because at least at the time that this was published, it was one of only two transiting exoplanets in this range between Earth and Neptune. Again, because of the methods that we have available to us, we aren't finding a ton of these guys out there. So anyway, this takes us back to um, the problem that's posed here, which is for small planets, we can't really know the composition just from the mass and the radius. Uh, there are a few papers that tried to figure it out anyway, including this one, which um, posed some models from a hydrogen rich to a pure water atmosphere and gave some kinds of theoretical guidelines on how future transmission spectra should interpret the wavelength variations in the transit depth. Uh, so certainly um, models and simulations are, are a very important piece of understanding these types of observations. Uh, this Rogers paper posed three possible models for the composition of the atmosphere, uh, which they describe in this kind of handy figure here. So in the middle is, I believe, the assumed bulk composition of the planet. And from each of these, it describes a different process for forming an atmosphere and what that atmosphere might look like. So again, all of these scenarios shown on this kind of silly three uh, pie chart thing are consistent with the observed mass and radius of the planet, uh, but they're obviously com completely different from each other. So, uh, let's see. If you weren't convinced already, uh, to constrain the composition of the atmosphere any further, we do need a transmission spectrum. So, uh, how they did this was, um, the authors of this paper about GJ1214b, uh, used the VLT telescopes to get simultaneous spectroscopy of their exoplanet, as well as six nearby reference stars. And uh, complete spectra were obtained for the wavelength range of 780 to 1,000 nanometers for each of the observed stars. And uh, for length of time that included two transits of GJ1214b, our lovely exoplanet that we're trying to study. Kind of the more transits you get, the more full orbits you get, the better, because uh, that can drive down your uh, noise component in your observations. So, uh, this is what they got. Uh, the spectra they got was summed into bins of 20 nanometers each. So basically the total spectrum that they observed was split into 11 phase curves, which are shown on uh, the left side of the plot here. These little dips are the transits. Um, and to the left of each one, it, it quotes the wavelength range. I'm not sure if that's visible to you all in the room, but uh, these phase curves also combined the data from the two observed transits to bring the noise down a bit. Uh, and yada yada, the combined fluxes of the reference stars were divided out of the light curves to correct for um, Earth's atmosphere and any kind of variations that Earth's atmosphere went through during that time, because again, these are ground-based observations. Uh, and the resulting corrected and normalized phase curves are what's shown here. Uh, and here we go. The transit models, which are shown as the black lines here, were fit to the data for each phase curve. Uh, and the right side shows the residuals. Basically, the flatter the residuals, the better the model fits to the data. 
Um, so these are looking like pretty, pretty flat lines on the right here. That's good news for our scientists. Um, and the model fits were used to measure the apparent planetary radius in each of the wavelength channels. So at these different wavelengths, what does it look like the radius of the planet is? And does that apparent radius change over the different wavelengths? Uh, and these, this data was used to make the final transmission spectrum. Uh, and this shows some results finally that we are able to interpret. So the apparent planetary radius at different wavelengths is shown as these black points here. Uh, and each of the black points corresponds to one of these phase curves in figure one. So they took the apparent uh, transit depth at each of these and they made it into one of these black points for the plot. All right, uh, and the plot also shows a few of the proposed options for the atmospheric composition. So in orange, we have a solar composition model, which is a hydrogen rich atmosphere. Uh, in blue, we have a pure water atmosphere, which is the most consistent with the data. And in green is a 70% water atmosphere, which is I believe the, the least amount of water that they could have where the spectrum was still within one sigma of the data. So close-ish to the data. So the data here is shown to be in pretty good agreement with some kind of water-dominated atmosphere. Uh, however, the possibilities shown in this plot ignore another possibility, which is that a high layer of clouds or haze um, is obscuring the lower parts of the atmosphere. Uh, and the authors went ahead and did further analysis which confirmed that a cloud deck at pressures less than 200 millibar uh, would also be able to match the data pretty well. So these observations that they got, even though they went ahead and did the transmission spectroscopy, still can't discern between those possibilities of either a water dominated atmosphere or a high cloud or haze deck. So, uh, that I'm, I'm going to wrap up here pretty soon, but um, the lesson that we can learn from that example of a real analysis of a transmission spectroscopy um, project is that um, basically it's very hard <laughs> to determine what exactly is the composition of an exoplanet atmosphere, especially when you get down to those smaller planets where the signal of the actual planet's radius is pretty small. And then when you're looking for variations in the in the depth of that transit at different wavelengths, that signal becomes even smaller. Um, we have a lot of successful examples of transmission spectroscopy, which nails down pretty clearly the composition of atmospheres of things like hot Jupiters or things even bigger like brown dwarfs, orbiting stars. But uh, when we try to push these methods down towards Earth-like planets, uh, it still becomes very difficult. So. Um, our, our good friend JWST is helping with that. Obviously, we get uh, better, uh, better quality data from that, and that always helps. But um, yeah, the lesson here is that there are a lot of degeneracies to break, and it's, it's a fun puzzle for those who are interested in it. So at this point, I'll stop, and I'll ask if there are any questions in the room. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for, for coming and talking to us. Um, you mentioned early on that methods like direct imaging require uh, a really bright exoplanet. And I'm wondering if, um, is that, mostly bright and reflected starlight or if the planet emits strongly in the infrared or maybe even the radio could could that show up on a direct detection too uh that is a great question that i wish i knew the answer to um so as far as this let's see if we can get back to the gif ah there we go um I don't know what wavelength this observation was taken in, but my assumption is that you're gonna want a planet with pretty strong infrared uh, emission and a lot of reflected starlight surely couldn't hurt. It really depends on what uh, wavelength your instrument is. Um, yeah, and, and it's kind of a, 
a double-edged sword because if you are looking for a lot of reflected starlight, that also means that you're looking at a wavelength where your host star is very bright, uh, which is something that you don't want because <laughs> you don't want your host star drowning out the emission from the exoplanet that you're looking for. So this is a, a pretty finicky method, and that's why there's only a handful of examples of it being done successfully, but yeah. Hi, thank you for the talk. How are hot Jupiters able to form so closely to their host stars? Excellent question. Uh, my answer to that, this is maybe a, a current field of study, maybe a little bit controversial. My answer to that would be they don't. Um, I think that's the most popular answer is that they, they don't and can't form that close to their host star. But during the, the star's evolution and the exoplanetary system's evolution, uh, by some process, they are driven closer to the host star. Uh, and then they find themselves somehow in a stable orbit around the host star. Um, but yeah, that, that's certainly a, a very active field of study. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the talk. I was wondering, I noticed in the examples of the systems you showed us, we had like the the Trappist one, which is all small rocky planets, and then we have like hot Jupiters. Yeah. Are there ways? To me, it sounds like if someone from a different star were to look at our system, they'd probably only see Jupiter and Saturn yeah. based on what we've seen. Are there ways that you can pick up those small planets in systems where we have since only seen large ones? Yes, that's another good question. That's something that um is a little too in the weeds for the likes of me to study, but some people do look for those smaller planets in exoplanet systems with larger exoplanets using timing variations. My understanding is that if you have, you know, pretty good long baseline observations of a larger planet uh, that's orbiting a star, um, you can look for small variations in the orbit of that larger planet that might indicate other objects in the same system. Uh, kind of exerting their gravitational influence. So even if we can't see those smaller planets in the same way, um, for example, if they're too small to be detected by transit or radial velocity, their influence still exerts on larger objects that we can't see in the system. Uh, yeah, so thanks uh, again for the talk. And to follow up a bit on the previous question, if aliens saw Jupiter and Saturn, what would they categorize them as? Because is there is there a category of cold Jupiter, essentially? Uh, yeah, so it's kind of funny how weird our solar system is. We really haven't found anything like it anywhere else with this kind of order of planets, with the small ones in the close-in orbits and then big ones out further. Uh, we certainly have found like Jupiter-sized planets, which aren't hot Jupiters, but are in kind of further out orbits. But to my knowledge, I don't know if anyone in the room can correct me, but to my knowledge, we haven't found a perfect Jupiter or Saturn analog in an exoplanet system uh, that has that kind of size at that distance of orbit, so. All right, thanks. Hi, um, I was curious, are there spectroscopy or atmospheric studying methods for other imaging methods? Obviously, if you're doing like radial velocity or something, you're not looking at the planet directly, so that'd be hard, but yeah. can you speak to that? Sure. Um, I would say that the transit method is the best that we have for studying atmospheres because the, the specific parameter that it probes is the radius. Um, and it kind of has the nice feature that the radius of the atmosphere is easy to observe when a planet transits. Um, other things like RV is probing the, the exoplanet's mass, which um, in an observation like that, it's very hard or maybe impossible to disentangle what of the mass is part of the bulk of the planet or what's part of the atmosphere. Um, as far as directly detected exoplanets, I don't know. That's something to think about. Um, 
my guess would be that just the the noise is is too high and we can't get that detailed of observations but um yeah some to look forward to there okay i will take this opportunity to go off a little bit about the specific niche thing that i study <laughs> let's see if i can find the right slide oh so we have transmission spectroscopy to study atmospheres but we also have the secondary eclipse when the planet disappears behind the star uh, and that enables something called emission spectroscopy where as the planet disappears behind the star kind of different slices of that planet's day side are shown to us uh, during the ingress and during the egress so as it's disappearing and then as it's emerging on the other side. So there are ways that we can look at the like the shape of the ingress and the egress to determine where the hottest point on the day side of the planet is. Um, and you would expect it, if you're just looking at a bare rock, no atmosphere, you would expect the hottest part of the exoplanet to be the substellar point, just the middle of the day side where the most starlight is hitting it the closest. But if you do these observations and you see that the shape of the ingress and egress reveals that the hotspot is offset a bit from the substellar point, you can learn something about the possible atmospheric circulation that's happening on that planet. If there are kind of strong winds or magnetic fields that would kind of whip an atmosphere around and move the hotspot. So yeah, there, there are certainly a lot of methods to investigate atmospheres, but most of them do have to do with transiting exoplanets. Sounds like that's it. Check the Zoom question. Oh, okay, sure. You might have a Lucas Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> ah, look, we got a Lucas Lawrence, yeah. So oh, Lucas, no. yes, I don't care. So Lucas asks, um, what do you think the future of exoplanet detection will be? Will the transit method probably remain dominant or may other methods like astrometry slash microlensing take on bigger roles? So I think microlensing people would say, our thing is so cool and we're going to do it more and more. Uh, and I hope they do. Genuinely, I hope they do. Microlensing is super cool. Um, it happens when a small body like, okay, relatively small. Let me see if I can explain this in a way that makes sense in words with no images. So if a uh, exoplanet system, star planets pass in front of a background source, that background source can lens around the thing that's passing in front of us. Uh, and the light that reaches us from the background source does some weird, cool stuff. So even if we can't see the exoplanet system that's passing in front, we can see its effect on the background source. Uh, my take on microlensing is that it's very cool, but again, it's very hard slash impossible to revisit those systems for follow-up observations. So we really only get the one shot to say, you know, here's what we see, here are the parameters that we think we can determine from this. And that's kind of it. Like, if there's a way to improve astrometry of these systems and track them as they pass across different background sources, or if they are orbiting in such a way that they pass the same background source multiple times, I think that will make microlensing a much better way of studying exoplanets. Is that the whole question? Yeah. Of course, Lucas also says, uh... Thank you for the great talk. Great, thanks. Great. Very good. Uh, anybody else? Uh, last chance. All right. Well, uh, thank you again, Maura, for a very good talk, very informative. Thanks for being um, here. Nice. <laughs> uh, just my quick little closing spiel. Um, this lecture series is hosted by the Cornell Astronomical Society. Um, most of you know that because you're club members, because some of you are new faces in here. Um, we host these every, you know, every few Fridays, and more importantly, uh, we uh, open the Fortes Observatory across the street, that always, uh, every Friday, 8 to 12, rain or clouds or more clouds or color clouds or sometimes clear skies. Uh, but yeah, please, huh? one second. 
Yes, and so next week's lecture is a special lecture that uh, will not be sullied by the weather. Uh, <laughs> and it's uh, a professor from, uh, sorry, a lecture from uh, Dr. Nicholson, our advisor. Um, and he's going to be talking about solar eclipses uh, in preparation for the upcoming, uh, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, for the eclipse on uh, April 8th. So uh, if you're interested in uh, eclipses, uh, please come by. We'd love to have you there and you can come tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, thank you all once again uh, for being here. Please feel free to uh, go over to the observatory and join us there for a little while. And uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs>